keeping in line with uh with the presumption of innocence the number one time when i hear this questioned and even hear people advocating that we abolish the presumption of innocence is oftentimes when it comes to rape cases um there was a man who came to my university i want to say 2013 and our professor was going to give us extra credit if we went and wrote a paper about it and so I went and I listened to them and I wrote the type of paper that I knew they wanted to hear and I got full points for it. And I was listening to this guy and his name is Dr. Jackson Katz um, from his Wikipedia page, uh, just to give a brief introduction to who he is for anyone who doesn't know. It says Jackson T. Katz is an American educator, filmmaker, and author. He is a creator of a gender violence prevention and education program entitled Mentors in Violence Prevention, which has been actively marketed to the U.S. military and various sporting organizations. Katz's work centers on violence, media, and masculinities with an added focus on media literacy. He has made several documentaries on the representation of women and men in media. Some of what he was saying I thought was interesting. Some of, I mean, obviously we all want, all decent people obviously want to cut down sexual assault and sexual violence as, as much as possible, want to make it non-existent if we could. But some of what this guy was saying I thought was a little strange. Well, I thought was a lot strange. And I remember when I was listening to him, he seemed to be advocating abolishing the presumption of innocence. So he never came right out and said it. And so I was kind of interested in what I was hearing from this guy. And so I started, you know, looking up things he'd written and in, in interviews and he's done a TED talk and stuff. And before I, before we did this uh, podcast, I was just kind of reading up on him again. And I wanted to get your opinion on just a few blurbs that he's written. He's also written for the Huffington Post. So although I like your pieces better, um, but he's, <laughs> Thank you. he doesn't like, referring to someone as an accuser. And from one of his articles on the Huffington Post that's titled, DSK's alleged victim should not be called his accuser, accuser in quotes, he wrote, when media coverage sets up a binary opposition between, quote, the accuser and, quote, the accused, there is no longer a victim or even an alleged victim, a flesh and blood person who was harmed by the violent act of another. Now, just right there, there's some problems I have with his language when he says there's no longer a victim. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't know that there ever was a victim to begin with. So how can you say there no longer was one, you know? And just when he talks about this type of thing and when it seems like his take is that if someone's accused, just they're guilty. It's just that's all there is to it. And he'll he'll also write, in that same train of thought that when you say, for example, let's say it's a, a woman who's accusing a man of rape, he'll say that it's problematic because if you refer to the woman as the accuser, now you're changing it into something that she is doing to him. Like now, now that it somehow makes him look like the victim because she is his accuser. And that's certainly not the way my mind works. I don't know if that's the way Dr. Jackson Katz's mind works, but when I hear accuser, I think, okay, this is someone who they've possibly had something horrible happen to them and they're trying to get what they hopefully sincerely believe is justice. Again, if they were really a victim. Anyway, how do you, how do you feel about that? Not referring to people as accusers, but calling them victims or in heel, he'll say that he'll compromise by referring to them as an alleged victim, as if that's a compromise. I mean, that's the most reasonable thing in the world. They are an alleged victim, just like there's an alleged perpetrator. But anyway, how do you well, feel exactly. about that? The idea that you should refer to somebody as the victim, if the whole point of the trial is to ascertain whether they're telling the truth or not, is madness. You clearly should not refer to them as the victim, and it's just a matter of accuracy, it's just a matter of factual accuracy. If the person has not yet been convicted, then the crime has not yet been proven to have taken place, and therefore there is no technical victim yet. Now, there could be an instance where victim would be appropriate, and that would be, for instance, if the defence conceded that there had been a rape, but disputed that their client was the rapist, then it might be acceptable to use the word victim. 
but there's nothing pejorative about using the word accuser. Do you buy his argument about that, that it, it, it then paints the woman in this no. hypothetical? Yeah, I don't either. I think it's no, a bizarre... No, I think that's just, yeah, I find it very strange and sort of um, extremist in a way. It just seems to be part of this uh, ongoing push by certain factions to um, stack the system even more against the accused uh, than it already is and to effectively pave the way for the removal of the presumption of innocence. That's that's what it sounds like to me. He goes on to say that, you know, it's designed to portray it as as no flesh and blood victim. Well, we don't know that there is one yet until there's been a trial and due process, but only an accuser facing off against the accused, right? And he's he also just to jump in, I think mm. he's also overthinking things here. When I'm writing a news story about a trial, I am not in a million years thinking about whether I am whether the language I'm using is portraying a flesh and blood person, blah blah. I mean that's just this is this is the problem with academics start concerning themselves with journalism. They don't really know what they're talking about, to be perfectly honest. I mean, my job is to communicate the facts. And the fact is person A is accusing person B of doing offence X, and person B denies doing offence X. And so in that scenario, is it factually accurate to refer to person A as the accuser? Yes. Is it also factually accurate to refer to them as the alleged victim? Yes. Now, if I'm writing a thousand-word story where I'm going to have to refer 20 times to the same person, I'm not going to say the alleged victim every time because it's boring. <laughs> so I'm also going to change the words that I use to stop people from thinking that I'm a terrible writer. So I might on one occasion think I might call them the accuser in the next line. I might call them the alleged victim and the next line. I might say the woman said in the next line, I might say uh, the defendant. And then later I might refer to the defendant as the accused um, or whatever, you know, so it's not the, this over analysis of media. I see it all the time. It's just bullshit. It's just navel gazing, pretentious bullshit. I'm pretty no <laughs> news reporter is making these kind of decisions when they're writing a news story. It's just it, it's lunacy. It's, the, it's like conspiracy theory. Well, the media is conspiring to portray her as no, it's not that you don't know what you're talking about go away. That's my answer. <laughs> he goes on to say in, in that article that I referenced earlier, that when you talk about um, the accuser and the accused, that the debate, the terms of the debate shift away from, quote, what happened or didn't happen in the hotel room or wherever else rapes might take place and onto the credibility yeah. of the two parties. Well, aren't we supposed to be evaluating the credibility of the two parties? Yeah, the whole point of a trial, see, this is an, another area where things are shifting, is that people are almost starting to see the legal system as some sort of support system for people that say they've been victims of crime. It's not. The legal system is designed to test evidence and make a decision about facts about what happened or what didn't happen or whether it can be proved that something happened or didn't happen. The legal system is not there to support victims. There are plenty of other organizations that exist that do fantastic work that are there to support victims. Many times they work in tandem with the legal system, witness support services, etc. Uh, but the legal system's job is to hear the facts in a very clinical way and then to ask a panel of impartial individuals to go away and analyze those facts and the evidence and make a decision about what they think did or did not happen. It's not supposed to be an emotional decision. The judge instructs the jury that it's not supposed to be an emotional decision. And my job as a reporter is also to treat the public as if they were the jury. Because as I said earlier, the courtroom is open to the public. Anybody in the public can go and sit in that courtroom and listen to that case. Most of them won't do that because A, there aren't enough seats. 
be there at work or they're looking after their kids or whatever. But they have an absolute right to know anything that goes on in any courtroom in this country. Absolute right. They're paying for it. Couldn't have they said it better for, myself. They pay for the courtroom. They pay for the judge. They pay for the prosecutor. Many cases, if the defendant is not a person of means, then they're paying for the defender as well. They're paying for the witness support service. They're paying for everything. And it's all being done in their name. It's all a trial is held in the public interest. Laws exist in the public interest to protect the public. So, for instance, it's in the public interest to have a law that says you're not allowed to rape people because that protects the public from being raped. Ergo, when somebody is prosecuted for allegedly raping someone, that is being done in the public interest using public money in a public courtroom. So the public has an absolute right to know what's going on in that courtroom. So this idea that in in you know that I'm infusing the article with language that's designed to blah 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 it's just drivel. Often that report has been written in five minutes in a rush. I've been in court all day, I need to get something written. And so I just write it and that's it. Is that you know the when academics concern themselves with journalism, they assume that journalists agonize over every word in the same way that uh that a um an academic does. My job is to succinctly relay information in a factual way. It's not to, you know, agonize over subtexts. Your point about the court system not being there as a support for victims is, I don't think that that can be overstated. And that's such a good point. And I think people need to remember that. It's, it's, it's there to find, I mean, the point is to find truth, right? We're not going to do anything to, as far as we can help it that'll bias the proceedings because we want to find out what the truth is of what happened. Um, there's two more points that Katz brought up that I really want to ask you about. And one, and the next one is he ends with a question. I'll read this little section that he wrote and then I'll let you answer his question. Um, he's talking about, again, when you refer to the, the two parties as the accuser and the accused, that it helps fuel the, the idea amongst the public that it's all a matter of he said, she said. And then he says, quote, but it's not. The person who reports a rape is only the first player in a chain of events and decisions ultimately made by police and prosecutors in a relatively rare and in relatively rare instances, juries. Ms. Diallo reported that she had been sexually assaulted, but she's not the one who brought the charges. That's what the district attorney did after weighing the available evidence that a crime was committed. By bringing charges, the DA, in effect, accused the suspect of committing a criminal offense. So why don't we call Manhattan District Attorney Cyrus R. Vance Jr. DSK's accuser? Why don't we, Charlie? Um, well, we don't do that because... Why would we do that? I mean, again, this is just silly academic twaddle. I mean, we call the district attorney the district attorney because they are the district attorney. We call the accuser the accuser because we're not allowed to use their name. Um, so we have to figure out these code words. Well, not code words, but, you know, we have to think of, of ways to refer to the alleged victim or the complainant or the accuser, or whatever you want to call them, usually all three. Um, in the space of one story because uh, they are granted anonymity in the proceedings. What so, about in America, where I think we we can use their names? I think it's at the judge's discretion in okay. America. Now, I'm not 100%, but I know, for instance, that in the Jackson case, mm. the judge had the option of referring to the family as Doe, Jane Doe, John Doe, etc., and banning the... Uh, press from using their names, but because they had already appeared in the media, most notably the boy and the siblings had appeared in the Living with Michael Jackson, Martin Bashir documentary, and then in the uh, rebuttal, the Michael Jackson Take Two thing, um, there was no logical reason why their names should be blanked out, because everybody already knew who they were. But, um, you know, in the UK... We grant immediate anonymity to um, anybody who makes an accusation of rape or something like that. And um, unless they choose to waive their anonymity, then, then that remains in place. 
And you have to establish their relationship to the case because the name doesn't tell you what the. We know what the relationship is when you say district attorney. We know what that person's relationship is to exactly. the court proceedings. So we have to establish what the relationship is when we start talking about Jane and John, or we don't know who's accusing who. So yeah, this it just irritates with this kind of academic um, whinging, you know, because it's it just demonstrates fundamental lack of understanding of what the job of a reporter is, which is to convey the information succinctly. You know, when you're trying to reduce um, four hours testimony or six hours testimony right. into a news story um, and remain as accurate as possible, you have to use shorthands. You can't publish a transcript because that would fill the newspaper from cover to cover. Um, you know, so how do you boil this down? Well, you just say the accuser, because now everybody who's reading that story knows exactly what you're talking about. It's that simple. This is how confused Katz is. He, this is the last thing I wanted to ask you about. He says in the end of his article that there is um, a solution to the misuse of the term accuser, which it's not misused in the first place. He, he just <laughs> makes a lot, he just asserts a lot of things in here, and he just assumes that people ex accept his premises, which I guess maybe university students do, but even when I was listening to him, I thought some of what this guy's saying, he doesn't sound like he's totally there. Um, <laughs> but he'll say, the solution to the non-problem that he thinks is a problem is simple. Refer to the complaining witness in a rape case as the victim. A compromise strategy is to use the term alleged victim, although, as many rape victim advocates point out, victims who report other crimes are rarely questioned about whether or not they were victimized. I read that last sentence and I thought, that's... I don't know if that's true. Is that true? I mean, it just seems like a weird assertion again because he makes a bunch of assertions and i'm like i don't even know if that's true because i started thinking about any instances i know where someone's accused someone of stealing or something and i'm like no i think they're always qu i think there's always questioning isn't there well it, you know it it probably is more prevalent in um cases of alleged sexual abuse because they are often cases where there is no third party evidence. Right, exactly. So if there's been a burglary and somebody's on trial for burglary and their house has been broken into, there will be evidence that the house has been broken into. There will be a smashed window, there'll be a door that's been smashed open, there will be items that were in the house that are no longer in the house, you know. So right. there's is quite clear that there is a crime that has been committed. Similarly if somebody is a has had the tires stolen from their car, then there will be evidence, namely the car sitting in the driveway with no tires on it. You know, so, but when you've got an allegation of a crime against a person, you are left in a situation where it is one word against another. The only last thing I wanted to say on Jackson Katz is it, to be fair, and that just to close out that article. He does say it at, towards the end of the um, article that when, if you use alleged victim, it says it treats the man or woman with respect. And he says, quote, and it crucially preserves the presumption of innocence for the alleged perpetrator. And to me, it's just weird that he'll throw that in at the end, like, because, like he yeah. knows that what he's written so far, it's uh, when he, cause just in the preceding paragraph, he says, yeah, it's, it's a simple solution. Just, re just refer to the complaining witness as the victim. He knows that this is bogus and bullshit. And so at the very end, he's just saying, oh, it's so crucial to preserve the presumption of innocence because he's, he's, kind of like thin under a thin veil tried to deconstruct that through his entire piece and then at the end he's just doing that i think to protect himself i mean does he get paid to write this or is this like a hobby i don't really understand what the point of this is this is just sounds like the ravings of a madman to me <laughs> i mean you know to to say that we should refer to somebody as the victim when it has not been established as a matter of fact that there is a crime is it's just crazy. He said just kind crazy. of weird things about, he'll say that violence against, now this, I, I'm not saying the first part of this is weird. He'll say violence against women isn't a women's issue. It's a men's issue. I'm like, well, is it one or the other? Well, it depends. It, it, yeah, you know, it does what depend. What if the woman has been beaten up by another woman? Right. 
and he'll say that it's men's responsibilities to, and, and not just, not just men who are rapists, but just men in general, just men. And I can't figure out if he's just trying to get brownie points from his audience in his own echo chamber or what, but I don't fully know what he, unless, unless he's assuming that most men are just standing around if they see a rape and there's, oh, look at that. Oh yeah, look, there's a rape going on. I mean, you know, I don't under. I, I just wish that we could, I wish people would stop pretending that we need Anderson Cooper to come on the television and tell all of us that raping is uncouth. Like, I think we well, all know that. Or we should yeah, know exactly. It. You know, it's like, you know, silliness. As if you're going to walk down the street and see a man punching a woman in the face and you're not going to do anything about it. You know, to, to say that this is all men's issue, it's like we're all sitting around on our hands watching women get beaten up and raped every day. It's just crackers. <laughs> um, I don't really, again, acad- I see in journalism, there are lots of academics. It must be close to a decade ago, I went to a seminar called The Future of Journalism or something, and there was this guy who was one of the speakers, the keynote speakers, is this little skinny sort of five foot two guy with the big mane of like uh, ginger ringlets. I just don't remember his name. But he basically came on stage and said, within two years, there will be no newspapers. They will all be dead. And, of course, you know, here we are a decade later and still plenty of newspapers around. Academics just seem to me to get paid to talk shit. I don't really understand who's paying them or why they're getting paid, but I just don't really put any stock in anything they say about anything. It's a, it's a kind of a uh, cliche, but they just do seem to be people that sit in offices imagining what must be going on in the real world. I mean, a lot of the stuff you're reading from... Dr. Katz is just... He'll, he'll also say things, and I've heard this echoed too, and I, I think it's kind of dangerous, some of what he says. He'll say that, that people should not teach women, you shouldn't teach a woman how not to get raped. In other words, like if I had a daughter, okay, I'd say, honey, you should be able to leave the house at 9 o'clock p.m. and walk to your friend's house in darkness wearing the shortest skirt you want. You, you should be able to, but unfortunately no fault of your own there's a lot of sickos out there and you want to be a little careful and you want to you want to not attract sickos i mean and and i'm not again that's <laughs> yeah. not saying that you're wrong yeah. it's just like i should be able to walk down some like inner city street uh in a jacket made out of 100 dollar bills okay but if i do that <laughs> yeah. there's some chance that that's not the optimal way for me to successfully walk through the inner city streets without getting beaten up and robbed. Right. So now, now I should be able to do that, but cause that's my choice, but it's not the smart thing for me to do. If I had a daughter and I tell her, if you want to go to some party and you want to dress sexy, whatever, granted, she's at an age where I'm not, you know, like maybe that's closer to 16, 17, right. I'd say go with the group, just fine, but just go with a group of friends. I don't want you walking you know, down some dark street alone, dressed all, you know, pretty yeah. for a party. I just don't, because I want you to be protected. And it's not that it's immoral for you to do it. It's just that I'm worried about you, and I don't want you to be a tar. I want you to be safe. That's 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 my motivation. Well, but he will say, just just to f- uh, finish my point real quick, he'll say, yeah. don't don't teach women. And people like him will say, don't don't teach women not to get raped. Teach men not to rape. And the idea is that there's all these men that would otherwise look at this girl and just go and attack her and rape her or at the party, just, just wait for their chance to rape her. But when they hear Dr. Jackson Katz, if they can hear him first say, Hey, that's wrong. They'll say, Oh geez, well, I was going to rape this girl that I saw walking down the street, but I just heard Dr. Jackson Katz do a Ted talk where he says I shouldn't do it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, this is just academia all over. I mean, you know, just what is the point of the shit? But there was, um, a story about a year or two years ago where somebody had developed a nail polish for women where the date uh, rape nail club, polish. Yeah. They put the nail polish, they put their finger in their drink and if their drink has been spiked, it will tell them because the nail polish will change color. And, um, there was a, this kind of a huge, crazy backlash from the feminist brigade saying, you know, this is a disgrace. You're blaming women for getting rapes. And it's like, how have you made this leap? You know, if I put a burglar alarm 
on my house. Well, let's say I don't put a burglar alarm on my house and the next house along does have a burglar alarm and then I get burgled. Then it's not my fault that I've been burgled. I didn't deserve to get burgled. Right. But I could have taken a precaution which might have stopped me getting burgled. Nobody's saying but that's it's victim a blaming. job. They'll say, they'll say, yeah, oh, you're a victim you know, blaming. You know, apparently taking precautions is victim blaming. That's okay. If you don't want to use the nail polish, don't use the nail polish. But, <laughs> you know, if so, if a woman wants to use the nail polish and then it saves her from getting raped, then it's almost like they're saying that woman's in the wrong. I don't, I don't understand what they're saying. You know, if, if that nail polish saves one woman from getting raped, what are you complaining about? I don't get it. If I walk down the inner city street in a jacket made of hundred dollar bills and I get beaten up <laughs> yeah. and robbed and you tell me that next time I shouldn't walk down the inner city street in a jacket made out of money, I'm going to tell you, you know, you know what, uh, award winning journalist Charles Thompson, you know what? Don't tell me not to be the victim of robbery. Go down to the inner city and tell them not to be robbers. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, good luck with that. Right. That's all I'm saying. You know, yeah, let's, yeah we'll put the, all the robbers in a classroom. We'll say, this is why you shouldn't rob people. Number one, it's very upsetting if you get robbed. Very, very upsetting. Number two, it's illegal. Shouldn't do things that are illegal, should we? No. Okay. Number three, people won't like you. They'll say, oh, he's a robber. Don't like him. Number four, you know, as if they're going to walk out of the classroom and go, oh, my life has been changed. Yeah. I'm going to go and become a Wall Street banker or something. You know, I mean, yeah. it, it, it's just stupidity. Well, well, if they become a Wall Street banker, they haven't listened very carefully to your lecture on not robbing people. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Okay, that was a bad example. I'm going to go and become a police officer. I, that's absolutely changed my perspective. Yeah. I didn't realize that it's not nice when you get robbed. Now that I think about it. Yeah. Oh, what have I been doing all this time? Oh, yeah, dear. it's very, you know, very strange. Yeah, stupidity. Yeah, it if, is. Stupidity. If you can give people an extra precaution and they want to use it, then what is the issue, really? Well, well Dr. Katz, I sure hope you're listening. That's all I can I, say. I mean, I, you know, I'd love to know who's paying them and where they're getting their money from. Yeah. You know, if, if you want to pay me like 50 grand a year to just make shit up, yeah. go for it. Yeah, yeah, P put words that are perfectly acceptable under a microscope until you can find some way they're problematic and write masturbatory blog posts all about how they need to be changed. 